Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this press conference with the uh, with UNICEF. Um, this is the uh, press conference dedicated to the launch of the report, the investment case for education and equity. Um, well, welcome also to everybody who's watching our live stream in the media center and around the globe. Um, um, glad you could join us. Let me introduce uh, the wonderful panel we have today to talk about the investment case uh, for education. To my immediate left is uh, Joka Brandt, the Deputy Executive, ex Deputy Executive Director of UNICEF. Uh, on her left, uh, Mr. Gordon Brown, who is the United Nations Special Envoy for Global Education. Um, the business voice joining us on the panel today is Mr. Koz Timmermans. He's a member and vice chairman of the management board for banking at ING Group. And um, all the way to the left, um, which I'm sure needs no further introduction, I'll do it anyways, is Angelique Kicho. She is the UNICEF Goodwill Ambassador and also recently has been awarded our Crystal Award here in Davos. So welcome everybody and uh, without further ado, I'll uh, pass on to, uh, to Joka Brandt um, to fill us in on what the key findings are of this uh, report on the investment case for education and equity, which <coughs> will be available for you here uh, after this press conference as well. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, um, Georg, and thanks. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thanks for uh, coming and watching and listening. Uh, it is a, a great pleasure to be here and to talk about two issues that I think we don't speak about very often at the World uh, uh, Economic Forum, uh, ed education and children. And it's uh, special to be here with uh, the others here, uh, Gordon and Coase and Angelique, uh, because all of us share, and we were just talking about it uh, uh, before this press conference, we really have a belief uh, in the power of education to uh, lift people uh, out of, pover of poverty. And we all agree that education is, uh, of course, a human right, and investing in it is uh, the right thing to do, uh, a moral ob obligation, as you will. But it's also uh, uh, smart uh, economics, because education can put people on a path towards good health, empowerment, and employment, and it helps to uh, rebuild more peaceful societies. It gives children in emergencies a future, a place of safety, and a sense of normalcy, and we all know that the benefits of girls' education go well beyond their own education, but extend to their children who have lead more healthier and educated lives because their mothers actually went to school. And yet there is an education crisis. 58 million children and 63 million adolescents are out of school. And worse, we're also facing a learning crisis because an estimated <coughs> 130 million children cannot read or ra write discount despite reaching grade four. And it's these two twin crises that are being addressed in this new UNICEF report, the investment case for education and e equity, which we are very pleased to launch here today. And the report is in effect a call for action, a call for action at a time when initial progress in enrolling children in school has slowed down and at a time when we, quite frankly, also do not have the demographics on our side. Because the population of school-aged children, especially in the poorest countries, is increasing, and it is increasing very, very fast. For instance, in sub-Saharan Africa, over 440 million children must be enrolled by 2030 to achieve basic education for all, which means that is two and a half times the number that are being enrolled today. And it is these children that will have to offer uh, a perspective, uh, an opportunity to grow into the productive citizens that we all want them to be. And so the report calls for three critical actions to get children in school and learning. The first is to invest more in education. The second is to invest more equitably. And the third is to invest more effectively. First, um, on uh, uh, investing more, low-income countries actually require uh, an additional $26 billion annually to provide basic education to all their children. And I know that $26 billion sounds like and obviously also is a lot of money, but just think about it. It's the equivalent of just about 5% of the annual profits of uh, the world's 15 highest-earning companies. And you know, thinking about it in that way might make it more 
manageable and also thinking about the risks of not making those investments, the risks of not giving those children the opportunities to grow into the productive citizens, as I said, that we all want them to be, and the effect that that will have on communities, on countries, on uh, economies. And of course, uh, government spending on uh, education uh, should increase, and the report also clearly states that you know, government budgets that are already uh, uh, limited should, um, um, should obviously increase through increased tax uh, revenue, and that there's, within those limited budgets, there's a lot of you know, competing priorities. But having said that, even, uh, we feel that even within that context, there's a room for countries to increase their uh, allocation to education. And then um, uh, externally, donors uh, actually have decreased their budgets by about, for education by about 10% in the last five years. So we feel that also donors and the private sector to which Coase will speak more should um, take up this particular investment case. Second is the issue of equity and uh, uh, the imperative to invest more uh, equitably. We, think, we tend to think that as long as we invest more then all children, including the most disadvantaged, will somehow automatically benefit. But that is not the case. And the report clearly states that, 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 states that on average <coughs> in low-income countries, about half of all public education resources are allocated to the 10% of students who are the most educated. And the resources going to the wealthiest quintile of children are up to 18 times larger than those to the poorest quintile. And you know, if we really want to um, make progress in education, we must turn that practice upside down and target our investments much better. And that means targeting them to the poor. We've got examples that this actually can be done. Uh, a couple of examples that uh, uh, are also in the report in Bangladesh. Uh, the poorest 20% of areas, students now get $27 per head compared to 18% in the wealthiest 20th percent of areas. And in Togo, in just over two years, 900 teachers were redeployed and nearly 6,000 new teachers were appointed to the most neediest schools. Thirdly, we need to invest more effectively in the right places on the right things, which include investment in learning, expanding preschool, of which the benefits are, are, are obvious, abolishing school fees, impl improving learning assessments, and being more accountable to communities for <coughs> education results. Obviously, there is no size-fits-all solution, and we must tailor our policies to countries' specific needs. But I think it's important that in this year, in 2015, when we are discussing the new development agenda, we should make sure that children are at the center of this agenda, and we must make sure that every child everywhere gets the education they're entitled to. So that we do not fail this poor girl in a rural area in, Malari, Mala, in Mali, a poor boy with a disability in Vietnam, or a Syrian refugee child in Lebanon. Because together, we can, and because we can, we must invest in education equitably and effectively for all children <coughs> everywhere. And I know that's a sentiment that is shared by my three partners here behind uh, uh, at the table. So I'll yeah. leave it to them to further elaborate. Thank you. Thank you for sharing these, uh, these results of the report. And clearly, there's a sense of urgency for more, uh, for more investment and equity in education. Mr. Brown. Education has been an issue that's been uh, close to your heart for a while now. Uh, would you share with us your perspective on this important issue? Yeah, I want to thank, uh, first of all, um, UNICEF, uh, Tony Lake and Yoko for this um, amazing report because it covers evidence from every continent about the level of inequality in opportunity across the world and the effects on the economy, on health, on society of failing to do uh, enough about it. And I'm very pleased to be with Klaus and with Angelique. And let me say, there is no more powerful advocate of uh, children's rights than Angelique, who is uh, revered across the world, uh, not just for her wonderful musical talent, but from, from, from putting the case for children wherever she, she goes. And I want to start with, a, with, a, with perhaps an illustration, the one that Yoko finished with. If you look around the world, 
uh, we have a crisis, a children's crisis. Uh, it was said once that the only international language that the world understands is the cry of a child. But it seems to me that over the last year, in crisis after crisis, we have neglected children, even in the most difficult, precarious, uh, and, and sad situations. And I want to take an example, uh, Lebanon and Syrian refugees. There are 500,000 children who are exiled from Syria in Lebanon. The Lebanese government agreed that they would provide educational places for all of these children. The teachers were persuaded that these children should be educated in Lebanese schools. The government agreed to a double shift system in the schools thanks to the work of uh, UNICEF. 100,000 children are now being educated in that way as a result of money that has been provided. But there are 400,000 children this year who could be educated, who are refugees, who are now on the streets, who are the most vulnerable children, where child labor, child marriage, child trafficking can be forced upon them because the international community has failed to recognize that for only a dollar a day, we could provide in existing schools educational opportunity for 400,000 more children. And this, in a crisis, is usually a case of us saying that there is a need, uh, but it's difficult to find a way of doing something about it. We have the schools, we have the teachers, we have the agreement of the government, uh, we have the plan. Uh, UNICEF has drawn it up, but we have not been able to find the extra 136 million in international funding that is needed. So here we have a crisis for refugees who may be in Lebanon for another 10 years, for all we know. Uh, here we have a challenge to the international community where for only a dollar a day with school places available, we could actually get children into school tomorrow. And here we have a government, probably the most uh, troubled uh, part of the world, where a government fighting uh, its own uh, battles to try to get its own public on board for this is prepared to risk uh, everything to allow these children to go to school, but we, the international community, have failed to provide the resources. Now, I'm convinced now that we need uh, an emergency fund for education uh, where there are humanitarian crises, uh, that countries should put up front money to make it possible for UNICEF and other organizations to provide help for children when they're in urgent need. We shouldn't have to wait a year or, in this case, more than a year for some help to come when we have a plan and we know we can do something urgently. And the importance of education in a crisis is that while, yes, every child needs shelter and needs food and nutrition and needs health care, a, ch a child also needs hope. And it is education and the chance that you can prepare for the future, you can plan for a job or the prospects of employment as you leave school. It is education that more than anything else uh, provides hope to children in the most difficult conflict situation. Now, half the children out of school in the world are in crisis countries where there are conflicts. And the last year has been a year where we celebrated the 25th anniversary of the Convention of the Rights of the Child, but it is a year that has been more marked by the violation of the rights of millions of children. And unless the world wakes up uh, to the fact that for a small amount of money per child, we can make a huge difference then we are going to stagger from crisis to crisis, and with all the best will in the world from UNICEF and other organizations, if the international community will not provide support, we will not be able to deal with these problems. As has just been said, aid generally has gone up over the last five years, although it is under pressure now. But education aid, particularly aid for basic education, has gone down, and we neglect it at our peril. And what this report makes absolutely clear is the consequences of doing nothing about this. In 50 years' time, we will still have girls in the poorest countries, in the poorest areas, in the poorest families of Africa who will not even be in primary education if current trends continue. In 100 years' time, there will still be girls, in particular girls in the most remote parts in the poorest areas, because we have not done enough, who will be denied the chance of secondary education. We've just heard of 650 million uh, school-age uh, children, uh, primary-age uh, uh, children, 120 million of, of, of these or more, 130 million, I think the figure actually, actually is, um, will be out of school by grade four. 
uh, about half these children uh, will not have uh, sufficient learning to enable them to have skills by the time they are out of formal education, and half the children will be out of um, primary education before they should naturally end it. And the inequalities are such that while 6% of graduates uh, in, uh, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa are in families uh, which are, where there's no poverty, uh, where, where there's poverty, 19% of people with secondary education, 28% with primary education, it's 50% for people with no uh, educational opportunity at all. And so there is a direct relationship between educational neglect, poverty, bad health, and inequality. And unless we recognize at the center of the future of the world is providing opportunity and bridging this gap between the opportunities people have and should have mm -hmm. and desire and the opportunities that the capacity of the education system has to deliver them, then we will continue to fail the children of the world. So this is a challenge, I think, from UNICEF to the business leaders at Davos, but also to the rest of the world, that their report shows glaring inequalities, a yawning gap between what should happen and what is happening. And it's time for us as a world to take the action that is necessary. All the research in the world proves that unless we act, uh, the opportunities available to children will be uh, m minuscule in many areas in 2050 as they are now. Uh, and therefore, this is a call to action that I and others would want to support. Thank you, Mr. Brown, for this very, very powerful call for action. Um, let it be heard loud and clear. Um, you mentioned the business leaders and, um, and their obligation. We have uh, somebody here with us on the panel, uh, Mr. Kors Timmermans, who uh, is actually active already. Um, and he can um, kindly share with us his perspective on why private sector uh, should be involved uh, from your perspective as uh, from the ING group, please. Sure. Um, I'd like to share uh, from our company, from ING, which is a bank, like how we do it and why we do this. I think uh, for us it's already a long time ago we started this. Um, if you're working in a bank, then you find in general that, you know, you have lots of clients and those clients, they have from time to time difficult financial decisions to make when you move houses, when you get married, when you get children. And what you find is educating your own client base in what type of decision to make is already a challenge, let alone to think about a lot of non-clients. What can we do in other communities to help? So I think already a long time ago, and I'll come back to it, we said like, well, what we need to do is to set up community investment program and making sure that we start to do something with particularly children to make them financially more aware. And that starts with education. Uh, why do we focus on young people? Um, in general, we said like, well, you know, good habits, they start early, so it's better to start programs at an early age. So we wanted to make sure that we set up programs to help people educate and to also help financial awareness. Um, what do we do? I think overall, both Gordon and Yoko, they can explain or they have explained even better why this is important for children, why this is important for society, and I can only subscribe to that. I think what is more important is what are we doing as a company on this? So what we did is already in 2005, we started in our whole bank a program which is called Chances for Children, and what we said is we have, let's now focus on all the programs which are run locally in each of these countries and let's try and put a scale behind there. Because in fact what we already had is once local partnerships in each of the countries and employee involvement. So an example of that would be even in a country like the Netherlands, I mean developed, we still have schools which are less uh, you know, less fortunate than other ones in certain areas. So, uh, you know, I myself do some teaching there as well, which is partly a humbling experience, but it's also, it's a good thing to do. So that is the local program. But next to that, we said like, we need to have the more international program. And that is basically looking at global educational initiatives. Uh, and that is the, what, what we do with our partnership with UNICEF. Now, why do we do that with UNICEF? I mean, the reason for us is very simple. I, we will have a bigger impact if we do it together with them than if we do it on our own. Uh, so that is the, the reason why we do it. We can accomplish more. So for instance, we right now, we have through our partnerships, we have programs running in Brazil, India, Ethiopia, and Zambia. 
And as, in essence, what we do, the aim of our partnership is to make sure that we give children access to quality education. Uh, and what we do with that is we try to help also uh, to work with the United Nations, the, the, the ambition we have for 2015, the development goal that every child has access to primary education. Where are we on this ourselves? I think as a company, what we have done is still so far, you know, we have reached basically a million children with education. And, you know, it's something within our company which is easy to explain because money, although it's a concrete thing and banks work with it, targets like having children giving access to education is a very yeah, visual thing. And, uh, you know, I must say it inspires our employees as well. So how do we do this? I mean, our employees, they are participating, volunteering, doing all kinds of work and fundraising activities. And the simple thing what we do as a bank is we basically say we top up. So in other words, uh, every euro you bring in, we add a euro to it. And that combined uh, makes us the program which we have. And, and you know, it, it works for our customers. They like it. Our, uh, you know, our employees like it. So in that sense, it's, it's an inspiring program. Um, we do it for the long term. We have done that already. We have celebrated a 10-year anniversary, uh, anniversary with UNICEF, and I think we have just signed an extension for the next three years. So we are moving also to a next phase of collaboration. So what are we trying to focus on right now? And actually, that, that will be new, and it's something we have to see, like, how will that work? And that is, how can we support adolescents as well? And in essence there, you'd also try to see like, you know, yes, there's various groups where there is social exclusion, where there's inequality and where there's poverty, how to reach them and how to make sure that they have a better future for them th themselves is something which is interesting and which will be our next part of focus. So if we can reach these people and if we can make them self-reliant, then I think like, hey, we're getting successful in this part and that is where we're looking forward to, to start uh, working with you and make that program work again. So uh, this is uh, basically the motivation, the results and the things we are doing on this. Thank you very much for sharing this, uh, this business perspective with us. I think it's very uh, encouraging to see uh, that you're active uh, like that. Anjali Kicho, you are and have a powerful voice. And we spoke earlier about your own uh, educational experiences. Would you share with us your ex experiences and also your perspective on this issue? And why do you think education matters? Thank you. Um, I think that my, um, my mother and my father were leaders in, uh, in, in, in education. And uh, you grow up and you realize that uh, what you were fighting when your father was telling you go to school, otherwise you don't sing and you bitch about it and you're angry about it, he was on the right side saying that. And um, my father was um, seen in my country as a very liberal man and giving us too much education. That was the, 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 <laughs> the thing that people say to him in his family and in the country. And my father used to answer people and said, if you don't educate your kid, what kind of future plan you have for them? And as a parent, they both invest in us all, especially the three girls out of 10 children that my parents have, because the pressure every year on my father to withdraw us from school, to be married early, was there every school year. And I didn't understand why he get angry at people at time, and why his answer was like, get out of my house, my daughters are not merchandisers, and I'm not selling them because they have a brain. They're gonna decide for their own lives. And I hope, that a lot of parents like that today. And um, we were not rich. My father was the only one with a paycheck. My mom was a housewife, but she was also educated. And therefore, both of them will speak the same language when it comes to education. And uh, today I am who I am because of the sacrifice of my parents. One salary, book, tutoring, uniform, whatever we needed was made available to us to, to learn. And at that time, the teachers were great. Today, we are having problems with teachers. The education that the kids are getting today, as the UNICEF report said, how many millions, 130 million or 50 million kids cannot read or write? Which means that we have to scale up also the teachers that are educating our, our kids. My concern in, in, in education is 
that we people, uh, I mean, I'm not talking about international community, as a human family, we have a responsibility toward our kids. I don't believe that any parents bring child to this world for the child to suffer. So if we know that education is key for the success of that child, why don't we do it? In the Western country, it's easier to a certain extent. But in Africa, it's said, it perceived that when boys go to school, it's more profitable for the family, not girls. And the problem we have in Africa is that the status of a girl when you're born, when you're born a girl in Africa, you don't have an identity. You are the daughter of your father that can marry you at any, any age into anybody he wanted to. And if you face those odds and you are taught in, in your house as a girl that you're just there to be a mother, you don't have to have an education, you don't need it, you start believing that you don't have any importance and you don't count. So school, building up school is a good thing, but also we have to also start vocational education for the parents that cannot go to school anymore. With my foundation, Batonga, secondary education I do because I understand that in order to transform my continent, we need highly educated girls. Secondary and tertiary education are key to transform completely our society. Primary education is important and early education too is important to get to that point. But once you educate a girl from secondary education, three years through the secondary education, if there's no drop out, that girl is continuing all the way to university. And what it, it gave us is that those women come back to put their boys and girls in school and they educate them differently. So what we are talking about today is for me, we have to have a holistic approach of education. As you said before, we cannot carve education, one system of education for everybody. Not every kid learn the same way. I was in Benin with UNICEF uh, two weeks ago and visited a program that we call the Second Chance Program mm -hmm. because we have kids that drop out of school between 10 and 17. Now, how do we get them back? Some of those kids are already working, they're app apprentice, and we have a deal with the, the, the bosses to give them seven hours in the year for them to have at least the primary education degree. And if they want to continue, they will continue. And while I was visiting that program, a young boy called Ulrich said to me, I'm learning mechanic right now, but it's just to understand how mechanic work to be able to implement that mechanism in politics because I want to become the minister of interior in my country. I said, what? He said, yes. I said, well, I mean, if you become a minister of interior, what are you going to do? And then he said, I want, I want to take care of my country as I take care of my family and my home. And that boy is just 15 years old. And you see, when you go to the people, the kids that we are trying to educate, and you talk to them, they teach us more and make me all more humble to do what I do today and to be the voice for those people that we won't see. I'm not doing this to be famous is not my point. It's not my purpose in life. It's because I believe deeply in the people of my continent. You give them the chance and you empower them. You don't pity them. You don't dehumanize them. You just sit with them and say, what do you need? That's where UNICEF is powerful because they, we work with local people. We work with the people that we are helping. Therefore, you have resort. If you don't, if you sit miles away and pouring money into it, patronizing the people. You leave and they withdraw the kids from school. They say, ah, it's not important. How do we make parents in Africa understand how important education is? By role models, by giving them example. How many mothers have come to me and said to me, I want my daughter to be like you. I want them to go to school. Some will come to me and say, we wanted to see if it was you, if it's legit. Because people come, they come and use your name. But if you tell us that this is important, we will follow up. We will do it. So what I do basically as a UNICEF Goodwill Ambassador, I am the voice of the one that have no voice that we don't see. Because you can help people by just seeing numbers. Numbers and data are important. But what I know from my mom and dad home is when a child comes to our house and the child is not going to school, my father and mother will sit down with the child and say, why aren't you in school? They are not the kids. Yeah, but my parents don't have the money. Okay, come here, come stay home, we put you to school. With one salary, not only my father put 10 children to school, 
But I would say he spent, he sent at least 100 kids to school. And some of them come back. They have jobs and they come back home and they, they say, this is what we are doing. I believe in giving back. And we cannot talk about economy. We cannot talk about peace in the world. We cannot talk about capitalism without talking about education. Because you put the message out there and people don't understand it, it doesn't work. I've seen an example of solar panel when people go take it and sell it. If they were educated, they understand that that solar panel is making their life be easier and the life of the children easier. Education is the core, is the foundation of everything we do. And I know it's hard because it's a long-term investment in education because you do not have the result right away. But if the CEO of this world want to continue being rich, want to save capitalism from chaos, they have to invest in education. They have to help UNICEF. They have to help every organization and lobby with us, with the government, and help the government that want to do something in that regard. The tax revenue of some countries in sub-Saharan Africa, as we were talking about it with, with Mr. Gordon Brown, is too little for them to invest much in it. So how do the, 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 the corporation world comes to the rescue of what they can give? What is the budget of a country? Why don't we double that when we come and say, you're gonna, we're going to put 4% out of the 8% revenue. We'll, we'll give you 8%. we we'll give the 4%. And then we're going to move forward. And putting disabled kids and boys and girls in school is becoming more and more crucial because if we educate the girls and we don't educate the boys, and they come back and marry those guys. It's like we've wasted money. If the, I mean, in, in, some, in some of the culture that we have, we have to face it. Some men don't want the girls, to, the, the wife, to be educated because they see it as a threat. So if we educate both of them, then what we do is that the gap that we're talking about, we reduce it because they're going to they're gonna help us put all the kids to school. Let's invest in education to live in the world of peace and take the fuel out of the terrorist group, all those angry people out there because they felt left out of the system that we have today. Our young kids in Europe, in developed countries too, are reaching out to those groups. We fail them because there's no opportunity given to them. Some of them goes to school and they have a lot of degree and they can't work. And I think for the stability of business world, of WEF, we need to give the young kid in the developed country, and in the non-developed country, hope, perspective, challenges, and opportunities. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for being such a powerful voice on that important issue. Um, mindful of the time, um, we will now open the floor for questions uh, from audi audience here in the room. Uh, for the benefit of our um, uh, audience online, please, if you could uh, state your name and your organization, um, there's a microphone available. Thank you. Gentleman in the front, please. Hi. Hi. Jim Edwards from Business Insider. I have a question for Mr. Brown on the uh, 130 million shortfall you said would have been needed to educate the 400,000 kids in uh, the refugees in Lebanon. Um, what about the... It's great that Lebanon has a government that wants to do that and... Uh, you know, has the ability to put on double shifts inside its schools to do that. But what about all the countries where the governments are, you know, frankly, pretty lousy and where the money will disappear and there's no transparency and there's a lot of corruption and, and so on and so forth? How do you do it in those countries? We've got to look at different ways of, of dealing with uh, crisis situations uh, where there are humanitarian uh, needs. And obviously, every country is different. But the point about Lebanon that I think people should understand is the barrier to action here is not the failure of a government, not corruption, not the lack of transparency, uh, not the inability to organize things. The failure is the failure of the international community to provide support. So $100 million has been provided, and I want to thank the governments that have put up money, but $163 million is the figure, it is still missing, uh, and therefore, Education that could be provided for roughly a dollar a day for these children is now impossible. Now, if we cannot show people that we can take action where the government is willing to do so and where the uh, 
Uh, teachers have supported the scheme, and where schools are actually built already, if we cannot prove we can do it in these situations, it's going to be difficult to prove to other countries that the international community will support them in a time of difficulty. And if we wish to expose the failure of other regimes to take action, then we've got to show what can be done in situations where the international community can make a difference overnight. So I've no doubt if we looked at um, South Sudan today, and we have had a plan for South Sudan, uh, which has been a crisis-ridden country for, for taking action, we would do it in a different way. We would involve the, uh, the churches, the voluntary organizations, the charities who want to do more in that uh, country. I've no doubt if we looked at uh, the problems of Boko Haram in northern Nigeria, our concept of safe schools is more relevant uh, there. But the truth is that uh, if the international community cannot respond when there is a plan that is viable, that can make a difference overnight, then you're not going to persuade people to make changes in, in, other, in other countries when they need to be changes. You're not going to prove that you could make a difference there if you can't make a difference here in Lebanon now. Thank you. We have a question in the back, please. Um, Ken Choi from Chosun Daily Newspaper, Korea. Uh, I fully support of uh, what you guys are saying here. Uh, uh, no doubt that education is the most important thing uh, in, in the world. Uh, but I'm just wondering uh, if you're aware of the situation back in China. Um, there are about 100,000 North Korean refugees, uh, and the son of the children out of these uh, North Korean refugees are, um, you know, they are not citizens, they are, they are non persona uh, non grata, and for that matter, they are totally deprived of education. And, uh, um, you know, it's a growing concern for a lot of uh, people in East Asia what to do with these people. Uh, how to educate them and things like that. So I'm just wondering if UNICEF is aware of, or if is there any programs like that, and uh, if you know the government of Korea or media from Korea can do something about it. Well, well look, South, South Korea and China are two countries that have invested in education heavily. They believe in the power of education uh, to change uh, lives. And I think whatever the political difficulties, most people would agree that where there are refugees, and where there are children who are vulnerable, mm. it's important for humanitarian reasons to take action. Exactly. That's true on the borders of Afghanistan and Pakistan, where there are stateless uh, citizens, where we need to act. It's true in other countries in the Middle East, where there are refugees that have come out of uh, Lebanon, but also out of Iraq now. Uh, and it would be true in the case of any refugee in, the, uh, I I I in Asia. So. Uh, we, we need to understand there are many kinds of humanitarian situations around the world, and that's the argument for having an upfront fund so we could actually take action immediately. Uh, and UNICEF and other international organizations are in a position to make a judgment about where help is most uh, needed. Uh, and I believe that with the traditions in education, South Koreans and Chinese people would, in the end, wish to help also. Can I, can I just add uh, to, well, just to, to emphasize these, uh, these points, I think exactly that's exactly the point that the report also makes, that we need to invest uh, uh, in, in, in the most marginalized and the most disadvantaged uh, uh, children. And the second point, indeed, that, that uh, really, again, also points to the fact that we're just not spending enough money in humanitarian settings, you know, like every child has a right to education. I mean, it's, it's despite the political or otherwise circumstances that, that, that they live in. Thank you, uh, lady, please. Uh, th these are the last two questions we can take, uh, but uh, please, thank you. My name is Isabel Sacco. I work for the Spanish news agency, EFE. Mm, you say that uh, what is more striking for me is that you say that most of the public uh, public money for education in, in the poorest countries go to the wealthiest <coughs> age, uh, family children. So um, why this is happening? What is the explanation for this? Mm. Uh, how are, do you model or have, what is the methodolo methodology of this uh, report? How have you found this uh, um, inequality? Ha did you go by, by neighborhoods? Uh, do, did you go by schools? How do you find this disparity? Let's take the second question first so we can uh, maybe answer that. Can we have the microphone in the front? The gentleman here in the first row. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm David Sirota with International Business Times. Um, I have a question about uh, funding and structures. In the United States, there's a big debate about um, public education and what kind of public education should exist, charter schools, mm -hmm. uh, schools with teachers' unions. Uh, the Gates Foundation uh, has been a big proponent of charter schools. 
Uh, my question is, um, when you're calling for more funding for public education across the globe, uh, it, does that come contingent on the type of funding for the type of schools? Uh, are there strictures on that? How do you make sure that the funding is for the right kinds of education? Who makes that determination? on the modeling also. If you can clearly put apart children going to uh, private schools, because uh, in the press releases, like, it uh, seems to be like all society, uh, the all children in, in society, but part of the wealthy families, um, the, school, the children goes to private schools, so public money is not there. Okay, thank you. On the um, on the on the inequity uh, on in, on the inequity point, I think um, you know it is um, there's 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 several reasons for that, and as the report also points out, it's very uh, context uh, uh, specific. But obviously, you know, uh, getting to uh, the more marginalised and more uh, disadvantaged children and getting them into school in a lot of contexts is more complicated because you're also talking about the poorest. They have less voice. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, the rural areas are less able to sort of make their points about the importance of getting the education there than, you know, urban, already educated uh, uh, people that, you know, know how to, uh, how to, how to make their, uh, how to make their uh, case. And as I said in my uh, example, it is actually possible to turn it around so the, the, the examples I gave, for instance, of Bangladesh and Togo, and the more in the report, is that it's possible to sort of change that and to sort of um, get teachers to actually go to these poorer areas, to these rural areas, to those places where they're actually more needed than where they would normally go if you don't provide the right incentives to them. So we can actually make uh, uh, that change, but it doesn't happen automatically. You do have to... Uh, you know, focus uh, specifically on how to reach the most, uh, uh, well, basically the kids that are uh, that are most in need. I think also on the, the the public the public education front. I mean, the point is that of course each uh, each country, each each government, civil society, people involved in education set their own programs. I mean, it's obvious that what works in the U.S. would not necessarily work even in the in, in, in the UK or live alone in, in, in Africa or in Asia. So I think we really need to be careful not to sort of come up with blueprints of things that would work everywhere. And I think it's up to, um, you know, UNICEF and others to sort of sit with governments concerned and actually make sure that we design the right programs based on an analysis of what the proper bottlenecks, what the exact bottlenecks are. I mean, why? are we not getting kids into school? The reasons are obviously not the same in each and every country, but we can do the analysis. And what the report actually says is that there are ways to reverse that trend, to reverse that, that, that policy that is now preventing them from, from, from getting into education. Just to finish that off, I mean, there, there, there are two issues here. One, one is, of course, the right of individual countries to make their own decisions yeah. about how they shape their education system according to the the needs and the, the, their economic um, uh, policies and their social uh, objectives. Uh, but there's a second thing which I think you're really referring to, which is international best practice and, and how we can uh, disseminate the, the, the best practices that, that exist in some countries and persuade other countries that they're worth looking at. And I think we are learning that the quality of teachers, mm. uh, which of course is what the Gates uh, Foundation has, has emphasized matters, the quality of head teachers and leadership in schools uh, uh, matters. Uh, the, 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 the curriculum itself is an issue that has got to be debated at all times because you've got to learn from what works and what doesn't work and how you meet the needs of, the, of, of your own generation. And I think there's an additional element of how you apply technology and use it most effectively to, 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 to build up success stories and attainment in education. Uh, and that's not at the expense of the teacher, but it's actually using uh, technology and teaching together to create to create better outcomes. So I think international best practice is moving us in these directions, which learn from the experience of charter schools, but other schools. And while there's a debate about Singapore, China, Korea, and all the successes there as well, I think I think these four elements uh, are vital in in, in every um, 
in every internationally successful model that we see. And the point of, uh, um, of technology and accountability, so linking those yeah, yeah, two yeah. up, you know, yeah, so yeah. that it's much, you know, should get much earlier and, and better feedback from actually parents and children themselves about what works and what doesn't work in school. I think we need to Yeah, thank you very much. I think we have to close here, mindful of the time. There will be time for, for questions bilaterally, I'm sure. And please go to the website of UNICEF and uh, find the report there, the investment case for education and equity. Thank you very much. Thank you.